Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast, where we seek to develop, inspire, and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now, before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow, or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now, here's what we've got for you today. I'm Rob Barber. I'm the Chief Fire Officer for Staffordshire Fire and Rescue Service. If what we created after the end of this was an ideal outcome, what would you want it to be? When, what, what would you want people to feel? What would you want them to think when they're listening to it? Either that be your friends, your family, your personnel, people of the fire service. What would be ideal? I think it gives people an insight into the role. It gives an insight into me as an individual. Uh, very often, you will only see sound bites of chief fire officers for different reasons, whether that's a political or a strategic uh, reason. And I think by sitting down and speaking with people, you get the true understanding of what Rob's about what Staffordshire Fire and Rescue Service is about and at the end of the day I'm trying to do a good job on a daily basis I recognise that the role of the chief you're not going to keep everybody happy all of the time um, <laughs> but if you explain why you please some you know, of the people some of the time and all exactly, of the people another yeah, time yeah. Got yeah, yeah. I often say and especially with the sector that we work in I know I've jumped straight into it there is that no one comes to work and maliciously tries to do a bad job. I don't think that attracts. Don't be, I don't think you have to worry about that because I don't think people in that of that ilk are attracted to this sector. I don't know where they go. I'm sure they end up somewhere. Lawyers, or I don't know. I'm sure there's lots of nice lawyers out there. Yeah. My brother-in-law is. Um, but yeah, I don't think we find those people in, that no. sector, in this sector anyway. I think we've got you know we've got a great sector and we've got some great people working in it. Mm. I think what my role is and the role of the exec team is to be people, be human rather than the chief. I'm Rob, I'm from Stoke. I've just gone through the organisation and ended up with a job. I'm no different, <laughs> no better than anyone else. So. Right, should we go for it? Yeah, okay. Rob Barber, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing, boss? Good, good to meet you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Sorry, I, I say boss and I say sir and things like that because it tends to just be the way I, of my upbringing. My dad was a scout leader and, and things like that. But that's that's something I kind of wanted to, to start with, really. I know it's not a question we wrote down, but... I came in here today, wouldn't have known you were Chief Fire Officer, you're wearing exactly the same as everybody else. I sort of shared with you a personal thing from my service about this whole like, I'm in a different, I'm in a new role now and I've got to wear a new uniform and I've, I've been pushing back a little bit around this creating barriers. How come you're sat there in a t-shirt same as everybody else? Because it's exactly that. I think sometimes within the sector, we we say we're changing, we say we're not hierarchical, and then everything that we do reinforces hierarchical, traditional cultures. Mm. I think sometimes the rank markings on shirts um, actually create barriers and suppress conversations and suppress discussion. Um, I'm Rob from Stoke. Um, I've come up through the organisation from a firefighter. I've worked hard and, and got a role that I've got now. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that I'm any better or any different or got all the right answers, far from it. Mm. Um, and I think we need to just think about how some high-performing teams actually are successful. Yeah. So if you look at any sporting team, you know, whether it's your, your, your local football team that you support, on a Saturday, all of the team go out in the same kit. Yeah. Whether you're the, the water person, the kit person, or the star striker, you've all got the same kit on. Mm. Your ultimate objective is to get three points at the end of that match. Yeah. Now, if our ultimate objective is to make Staffordshire the safest place to be, we're all part of that team. Mm. Whether you're operational, non-operational, it doesn't matter. So by making sure we've all got the same team kit on and there's no segregation... It doesn't say anybody's more important than anyone else, far mm. from it. I love what you say there about suffocating um, conversations or sort of hampering opinion because there is that sometimes, and you can feel it sometimes when you walk into a room or when, I'm sure maybe when you've observed people of your position walk into rooms, the temperature or the mood changes or there's a random silence or there's a, there's a hush or a whispering across the room and you think, what a shame, first and foremost, but also... What am I? What am I not hearing? Not as in like, is there a secret? But like, you can have a, you can probably become delusional about what you believe your team, the sports team, your service, your company, your organisation, what you believe it to be. And if your role is to try and steer the strategic objective, but also if your role is to try and set the tempo for the culture, if you don't know what the culture is, exactly. how, how are you even are you even part of it? If if that if that's the case, and, I, and that's what. That's where I feel it's not probably not fair on a lot of leaders of organisations and certainly chief fire officers. If if we are creating that big void, how can we ever expect them 
and this is not, I'm not sympathising with senior leadership all the time, right? but how can we expect them to understand the issues if we keep changing who we are when we're around them? Yeah, yeah, and it, I, I always think of the old um, <clears throat> emperor's new clothes, you know, and that's what, <laughs> yeah, it, you, yeah, if yeah, you're not absolutely. careful, that's the vacuum. Boss, yeah. You look great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the vacuum you can fall into. Um, you know, I, I just think there's deference to rank a lot of the time, mm -hmm. And I don't want that. I'm not getting the, the ground truth. I need to understand the organisation, warts and all. Mm. Don't just tell me the good things. I need to understand the things that are impacting individuals on a daily basis. Can't say I can solve all the problems. I'm not trying to be a heroic leader, mm. giving everybody all the answers. But actually, the first bit of being a good leader is to listen and to understand and not to understand it from a strategic perspective. For me to understand all perspectives, then I see all of the issue. Mm -hmm. I don't just see my perspective and my one-sided vision of it. Mm -hmm. And then create solutions, create approaches that actually have listened to people and taken it on board because I think that way you get a far more engaged service and you get a far better outcome mm -hmm. as the end result. Today's episode was once again brought to you by William Wood Watches. With the tagline, once forgotten, now reborn, every single watch has 100 years of firefighting history in it. They take an original Meriwether brass firefighter's helmet worn by firefighters in Britain in the 1920s and melt it inside every single William Wood watch. All of the craftsmanship is carried out in the heart of London and they are proud to lock in the legacy of the brave firefighting heroes in every single timepiece. I think one of my favorite things about these watches is the fire hose straps. Now, these have gone from landfill to effectively luxury now. They receive fire hose from a massive amount of fire services from all around the world, which has come to the end of its life. The majority of the fire hose around the world is unfortunately ends in landfill usually. They clean the hose, repurpose it, and sew it into the luxury watch straps themselves. I always wear the red one, but when you get your watch, it comes with a series of different ones you can get. You can explore the full range of upcycled straps on their website, and you can see the link in the episode notes. If you head over to their website, you'll be able to check out the Jubilee, the Triumph, the Valiant, the Bronze, and the Chivalrous. All of those watches are available right there, and you can spread the cost of these over three to six months interest-free. So for the pulse of the fire service right there on your wrist, head over to williamwoodwatches.com and take a look. How do you deal then with being fed so many problems, so many challenges, so many issues from a sociological to uh, equipment to pay to rules to regulations to service, you know, individuals you know that will have their own personal challenges and not having the answers because most people you're, you're right i know you alluded to it there most people think as the leader they need to have the answer um <clears throat> and i saw this as a micro example recently when i had a crew manager that i was working with and they just come into position and they said pete i need i need to i need you to put me on for my workplace trainer stuff i need to get all my tickets i said okay cool i acknowledge that great love that you want to develop in that <clears throat> what's the rush? Why do you think you need to get them? Because I think you, you know, you know, you know, and I'm not saying you can't have them, you know, but why do you want them? He says, well, when I'm out there leading drills, I need to know that what we're doing is the right thing. I said, well, that's okay. Cause actually Sarah did, uh, for example, the RTC workplace trainer about four weeks ago. So she is on it. You know, she, yeah. she, she's hot on the latest knowledge. So she'll, if she, said, but how do I know if she's doing it right? I said, well, you probably won't. I says, but that, you know, we work, so we work on a non-technical station, the one that I'm on. But I said, use a technical rescue example. I says, they will have a rope lead, they'll have a water lead, they'll have an animal lead. The leader, in, in quotation marks, doesn't need to have the answers. You know, they need to create an environment yeah. that can acknowledge. So how do you do that? that? That's very easy to say on a low level because functional skills are functional skills. We get that. When the answers aren't obvious and when they're so multifaceted, how do you deal with Ha not knowing the answers and and I was so like sitting in the mud where you're kind of like you're sat you sat in the problem but you don't want to scream to get out you be impatient enough to sit there and understand it yeah I think it's the skills that we have and the ones that you've just alluded to there with your example it's exactly the same approach that you need to apply at a strategic level mm. look I haven't got all the answers far from it mm. I've got to be absolutely strong in my confidence that I can say that, I can say it publicly to the organisation well, because you, that gives like, you strength. You, you'll have people in finance working beneath you. Now, in their own in their own sector, yeah. they are qualified the experts. in yeah, a yeah. sector, in IT, in learning and development, HR. Well, it's the same you, you, you're never going to know what they know. So if you go out on an appliance today and if it's mixed crude, you've got on-call, you've got whole time, whatever, and we're going to an electrical installation, 
If I've got somebody in the back that in their primary employment <laughs> is an electrician, <laughs> I'm not leading this incident. No, yeah, okay, yeah, absolutely. I'll be there, I'll be the point of command, all the rest of it, and take yeah. accountability. But I'm going to utilise the skills, experience, and knowledge of the experts that I've got around me. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly the same as I do on a daily basis with all of the strategic decision-making. If it becomes me and me alone, mm-hmm. that's a dictatorship. Yeah. And we've known what happens under dictatorships yeah. previously, don't we? So we just need to be able to, as I say, have the confidence to say when we've made a mistake, mm-hmm. have the confidence to say, I haven't got all the answers, mm-hmm. but utilise the skills, knowledge and experience throughout the organisation at all levels mm. in order to progress the organisation to be the best we possibly can be. When we look at the, um, and again, this is just something that's just come to mind, the uh, they are sort of grey book, green book analogy of, because example, someone working in finance. Now, historically, I remember, you know, been around for longer than me, but there were, there were times where we'd have group managers or others from a firefighting background who would be leading that section. Um, and I think at times it's probably cost us a lot of money. <laughs> it's probably cost us, you know. Yeah. And we don't, we, not that we don't want to. Well, well, we don't want to take away all of the opportunities for for, for ground level firefighters to progress. But also, we do want to get the diversity of experience from yeah. all the other sectors. Where does your mind sit in that balance? So maybe even just from a personal, not from this. I know it's hard to delineate the differentiate between the two between your role in Staffordshire. But where do we sit in that? Because I. I kind of, it reassures me actually, certainly my role now in our headquarters, when I sit down with somebody that I know is a sector expert, I feel more comfortable in deferring to them. I feel like when it's a bunch of firefighters sat around together, we'll get to an answer. Is it the best one? Probably not always. We need need a few more experts in the room sometimes. I'm fully committed to putting the round pegs in round holes. Yeah. You know, and as you've said, I'd rather have somebody that's qualified as my head of finance rather than somebody who's come up from a firefighter position yeah. and maybe got some qualifications but isn't a sector expert. Mm. Um, I think that diversity within the organisation is really powerful because they bring so much more into an organisation. Mm. And for those key skills, you know, whether it's for the head of ICT to be an operational role, then yeah. that's wrong. Yeah. You know, technology they're damned if they do the damn exactly. if they don't as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you really do need to know what you're doing there's there. There's <laughs> got to be, Pete, that understanding and link to, you know, how it improves work on a daily basis. Yeah. But they really, and, and I'm, I'm really keen in direct entry at the moment. I was about to ask you that because we spoke with, and I'm really annoyed the lady's name's going to escape me. Uh, I think this is Chief of East Sussex. Spoke to yeah, the women Dawn Whitaker. Dawn. Yeah, yeah. Love Dawn. She came yeah, yeah. from John Lewis, I yes, think. Yes, that's right. Really interesting lady, author. She's going to come on the podcast. Big on neurodiversity, but anyway, she's a great example of someone that can come in and really embrace the culture. Has she yep. been there from far, far ground up? No, we know we has. She hasn't. Does it diminish her ability to lead the service? I don't think so. I've had very limited interactions with her, but yeah, you were saying yeah, yeah. about direct entry, and I think you know, I'm I'm on the board of the direct entry project. I'm really committed to it because I think at the levels that we're looking at, station manager, area manager, okay. and then above. I think it'll be really positive for the organisation. We've got to be able to, for those people coming in, put a very specific development programme in, make them understand the stresses, strains and reality of the firefighter role. Because if they haven't got that, they could make some very strange decisions in the fullness of time. So that's all been developed. But I do think that we can bring expertise in terms of the other parts of the role. And you have to remember, the operational side of a strategic manager is a lot lower than as a firefighter. So why should they be doing 90% of their development around ops? They've got to understand it, but they don't need to be competent in it. I think there's something called, it might be called the Peter Principle, actually, where we reach a level of optimum ability and we've got to be very careful not to not to get promoted beyond that. And I feel like there's a really narrowing pool of talent in the UK Fire and Rescue Service with the greatest respect to operational personnel. But like... The difference between those that are willing to progress, and again, there's lots of ways to progress, but in this analogy, I'm just talking about um, vertically through an organization, and those that perhaps should. It's a bit like, if you've only got so many people that are going for station or group manager level, and you're like, not because they're not willing to put in the time, but you're just like, no one's quite there at the minute, because we're going through so much retirement, hemorrhaging so much experience, that there is a lot of people, perhaps, we have, we have the risk of putting people in positions they're not quite ready for yet. And it's not to say they'll never be ready, 
but we don't want to rush and put people in positions that they're not ready for. Whereas I think that direct entry analogy will be a great example because also I think those people were perhaps never going to come in unless mm. they came in at direct entry because yeah. they weren't going to come in at firefighter level on whatever your, you know, people might start at 21, 25, 26, whatever, unless they're on London wages, you know, they'll come in at that level. Only it's not going to attract certain aspects of talent yeah. that, you know, versus, I think the only one that might be a sticking point is the station manager level. Because I don't think people will disagree at group and, and, and other strategic levels because they are a little bit, I think your ability to make a, um, uh, a decision that may directly impact the, the well-being, health, well-being, life of a firefighter is, is more taken away. And please correct me if I'm wrong, because obviously well, I'm not at that level. But if you're at station manager level, you could be on Instagram making a decision where that might be a factor. So that's maybe the only one that worry people. I don't know. But what's the difference to the military doing it? I totally agree. Okay. I they, totally, they're going out, I they're going out and, and yeah. killing people, yeah. defending our country, and it, it's worked for them for many years. Yeah. The key to it is the development program that they go through. Yeah. You know, let's not think that you know because i've been on a station for 15 years i've got 15 years of experience that means me better makes me better than someone else far from it i could have had 15 years of really poor experience which I could be sat in a nowhere exactly. station as well Done two nothing. calls a month exactly so i think we need to look at the individual mm -hmm. the values base of the individuals the skills that they bring but also the skills that they've developed outside of the sector mm. because that's the way you change the sector otherwise we are all institutionalised, no matter how open-minded yeah, we think we are. Bias. We are. Yeah, and we, we see things that. through one lens. 100%. So to bring a number of different perspectives, a number of different lenses in, will strengthen the organisation. I get it, and I get why people might be uh, concerned about it. I'm concerned about it, because if it goes wrong, it's me who sat in the, yeah. the, the dock answering some very difficult questions. Um, but I'm for, I am absolutely assured that the programme that we've delivered and developed mm will make sure that those individuals are as competent as anyone else. Hmm. Now, I want to get back to some of the stuff I was in planning. Yeah, yeah. You were appointed CFO in October. I've written down October, was it October? Yeah, October 21. October? Yeah. October 21, right in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> um, how was it, you know, coming into, because you're kind of a little bit like a wartime general now, because you came in, you didn't come in during peacetime. With, no, not like, yeah, know, yeah. wartime maybe a bit of an exaggerated term. You came in and it was already in a very uncertain time. A lot of people were worried financially, emotionally, physically, things we didn't understand, lots of unknown unknowns. What was it like coming into it? Because not the ideal time to come in. To no, it, it, was, it was difficult. I was the deputy for five years in yeah. Staffordshire, so I knew the organisation really well. We had a, a real difficult time through the pandemic. We lost uh, a crew manager no uh, to COVID in, in the first lockdown. So it was a really unsettling, uh, very difficult time for the organisation and to manage everybody and, and everybody's well-being through that was, was a tough time. Mm. So I then, think to, anybody did it 100% right. No. We were all learning, yeah. and learning no. on the fly. We have our own quote-unquote risk assessments for similar-ish things, but it was very much like well, what feels right versus... How will, how will that work for everybody else versus can we keep... Because we can't just... like Some businesses could close down. We can't just go, you know what, let's pack this up and we'll and come back in Peter, two years see what it's like. I think that's probably one of the key stresses that I had to manage. So for Green Book, for other people in private sector organisations, go and work at home, lock yourself away, keep yeah. your family safe, not going to engage with the public. Band down the Our firefighters couldn't do that. They had to come into work. So the additional stresses that I don't think have been highlighted enough within the sector yeah. was that stress of, right, I'm a firefighter, I want to keep my family safe, yeah. but I've got to go into work. Yeah. Is the environment controlled? Are the risk assessments in place? There's no, there was no guidance for this. This is the first time the country has gone through it. And the government direction and guidance was changing on a daily basis yeah. those five o'clock briefings were my nemesis and information is a dangerous <laughs> thing as well exactly. because we've never been in such a state now with the greatest respect to your predecessors and other people we've never been in such a state where information is so freely available but also so unvalidated yeah, at times yeah. and i remember speaking to our chief you know and they were saying you know well how, how soon do you hear about stuff when you hear about it we are i'm not in like a secret group i don't get an email from the whatever nfcc or wherever it doesn't 
I'm sat there watching the telly yeah. as you watch the telly, and then we're having a quick meeting. And, th- and that was the difficulty. <laughs> so five o'clock briefings. Yeah. You've got you know, translations. People are there, and you're learning about it. And then we're getting phone call, email after email. What yeah. we're doing about that? Yeah. I've literally just found out. Yeah. So we're trying to change process and policy overnight. And then it changes again the next day. So it, it was a difficult time. But what I would say, our oh, people have been fantastic throughout. Mm. You know, we had a really difficult time at the start, but everybody understood their role, the, the things that they needed to put in place to keep the workplace safe, mm. to keep their colleagues safe, but also to keep our community members safe. And, you know, I've been very open. I've just presented everybody in the service uh, a commendation around the work that they've done through the COVID pandemic because you mentioned wartime, nice. and, and I do see it as our generation's mm. war. Yeah. You know, we focused on a key objective and we delivered against that objective. And I think people, it, it needs to be recognised the part that everybody played, whether you're the cleaner or the chief fire officer, it doesn't matter. Everybody played a part. Through as harrowing that. as things like that are, I always think it like, um, not solidified, but you know, calcified. It brings everybody together. It's a bit like when you hit a material and it solidifies. Yep. Do you know what I mean? When yeah. And we see that with the light war time. Do you know what I mean? When something gets attacked from an unknown, and that's effectively what this was, everybody it tends to draw people together. You don't get lost in the minutiae of your own personal life yeah. as much not that you should or you shouldn't but it's like it does have a very much an effect of bringing people together working together doing the best you can with what we've got yeah and yeah. i think we saw that not just within the sector but when you look at the partnership environment mm. under the local resilience forum yeah, yeah, actually yeah. the partnership matured very very quickly yeah. now my frustration with that was two weeks before we go into a pandemic we were saying we couldn't share data on vulnerable people yeah. all of a sudden we're sharing all the data. Now I'm saying if we can do that in a time of crisis, mm. why can't we do that in a time of peace? I want to as much of know? that as it goes away as well because like, we had a, a gentleman, Chris Selleck, on the podcast and he did a 6 months comment uh, into one of the um, uh, ICUs, intensive care units through the COVID thing. And I know lots of different services, like some have driven ambulances, some have done vaccines, all that sort of stuff. Um, I love the American model where yeah. you know I like to see that we're all on one team, we're all working together. I'll be honest, like I respect the police, I love the police. I'm not super keen on us adopting too much of their stuff because I think it's really scary. <laughs> um, but I see us being very closely aligned to a lot of the work that our, the paramedics and a lot yeah, of medical staff do. So when we started doing that, I was super keen on it. I've done the workplace training stuff with our trauma for ages. So I love to see us do that. And I know it's a union thing and perhaps it's not right for you to comment on it. But I'm like, I don't want us to lose that. Because like you say, during the, during the pandemic, it was fine for everybody to do it then. Why can't we keep doing it? Yeah. And I, th- I, mean? I do think the work with health is a fundamental part of where we so need to go to. Because we do it anyway. Because yeah, yeah, if, we, yeah. if we go there and there's no ambulance, as long as we're going to do the, everything, then we're, we're not we, as good as them. But if you know. we've got the right training, we've got the right equipment, and we've got the right oversight and assurance, you know, we, are, we don't want to be fully trained paramedics. We've got them out there. Mm-hmm. But what part in the health structure, where can we make the most impact? Mm. We are a rescue service. Yeah. It's a different type of rescue. And we just need to flip our minds a it's little bit. It's a big bit spectrum between us yeah, yeah. and a fully fledged paramedic. Exactly. People yeah, look yeah. at it very like, uh, you know, very sort of one and zero. Yeah. You know, very but binary. Just treat it's it not like, like it's a, a big spectrum. Where do we want to sit on that? Treat it like a, any incident you will go to today. Yeah. We're not going to solve the entirety of every incident that you go to. You can stop it getting worse and you can stabilise. And that's what we need to think about. Yeah. Because those people are at, are at their time of need, mm. and I think we can play a massive part as a sector to stop them getting worse and to make sure we make an intervention. Yeah. We know the complexity of the health system that's broken, yeah. um, and you know ambulances waiting 15 hours outside A and E. We can't solve that, no. but we can play a part. Yeah, 100%. Now, I wanted to ask you, and we sort of alluded to it earlier, around um, recruitment and about the balances between on-call, because I think about 60% of your of yep. your staff are, are on-call. I was on-call for for 10 years, absolutely loved it. I think I'm probably going to go back and do it again if the watch manager that's there moves, not because I dislike <laughs> him, but I would go back to, to do that role there because I, I loved it, absolutely loved it, and it, there's a richness of it. Um how do we keep things like recruitment? Because historically in my service, it's always been, and I think I want to say from UKY, from speaking to people, it's really hard yep. to recruit on call because they tend to be in areas of lower population sometimes um, and it's hard to get people in, cost of living is going up, and, and, and. How, how have you managed, because the 60% is a lot, 
you know, so it's a big part of your organization. So what are you doing well that other people could learn from or how are you doing it? Or (laughs) I don't think we're doing it well. I think it's a 1930s, 40s system trying to operate in 2022. Let's be realistic about that. Yeah. Um, Society's changed massively. Families that live generation after generation in a small rural village doesn't happen anymore. We've got a transient workforce. Mm. So we need to understand that. But our system has stayed the same it was in 1940. Yeah. So we need to look at that. Um, we also, because of the reduction in demand, operational demand, that creates another issue because people join thinking they're going to run into burning buildings every day, saving babies. It doesn't happen. So when people come in, put the life on hold for 120 hours a week, can't go out with the kids, can't, you know, do the shopping. It used all the to feel like it. like supervised visitation, you yeah. know. And I used to have to like go and sit with my parents with my kids because yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, I've got to stay and call. And like you say, it's a massive. But then they're not sacrifice. getting called out. Yeah, Our right. attrition rate is about three and a half years, so really? I'm not getting payback on the investment we're making. So we've got to do oh. things different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paramedics is about five years. Yeah, yeah. Which well, I think paramedics has started dropping as well. Um, but you have to look at it and think, right? How can we do it different? And I do think. By increasing the variety of the activity, so the stuff we've just talked about around health, working with partners, also changing the way in which we mobilise. So currently, if our pump goes below four, mm. we'll only go out to small fires. Well, actually, yeah. I know how many, how many can it ride with? Sorry? How many, you we, we can go down to three for okay. small fires only. Yeah, yeah. But so same as a lot of tactical response yeah, vehicles. Yeah. But do they ride a normal appliance for three? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. But look at different things. You know, if you're going out to falls response, for example, two people can go out to falls response. Yeah, two people can actually go out on one appliance to a makeup hmm. because it's not the appliances that deal with the incident. It's the people on the appliances. Jeez. So rather than looking at mobilising by appliances... Look at mobilising how many people you need to the incident. Okay. And I know I've been on incidents many times where an extra pair of hands would have been really, really useful. Mm. So I've got two people that are sat 10 minutes from an incident that will never get mobilised, but I'm happy to wait 15 minutes for four people to come. Yeah. Well, those two people could have mobilised. Another two people from another... And all of a sudden, I've got the four people. They're there, in, two, five, five. they're there in eight minutes rather than 15. So yeah, yeah. I think we just need to change the way we're looking at that. We've changed the way we recruit as well. We used to do exactly the same as the whole time. But people who are on call for us now can transition to whole time quite easily. Yeah. Um, because... I see that as try before you buy, you know. Yeah. We know the individuals, they've been delivering. Some have done whole time contracts. Well. We've we're invested in them. Everybody that comes from Civvy Street and sits in front of me in a shirt and tie and says everything they gamble. want to hear, <laughs> I don't know them, you know. I can't <laughs> validate some of the things they're saying. You know what it's the same sometimes with promotions as well. I've I've done 20 something processes over the last ten years. Um, it's almost a running joke sometimes. I've been successful yeah, yeah, in a few, yeah. don't get me wrong. But I'm a big fan of temporary promotions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know it's not something I was going to talk to you about, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it because I'm a bit like, like you say, with the greatest respect, you can kind of, you can BS most people for an hour yeah. in saying the right things. And sometimes, and, and I'd love to ask you how you think about the processes that you do and all that sort of stuff. A lot of stuff is, it, it, we have to come up with the metrics so it becomes a tick box exercise in some services, not saying that's your service. But once you're in the job, if I then go, oh no, yeah. You're nothing like what you said you were going to do, man. So, trying to trying to get somebody out of a job is almost not so impossible. I'm a firm believer, and we need to change the promotion process. Um, an hour, an hour and a half, you know, presenting to me and talking to me, or or whoever's running the process, doesn't give a true reflection of the individual. We get pe- some people that chuck the hat and the ring for whatever reason. Yeah, well, they just go. Well, I tell you what. I might as well go but, for it. But they perform really well on the day. They get the role and then revert to type the very next day. Yeah. So, you know, I'm just playing with an idea at the moment about you do a a gateway. Yeah. So a few, you know, simple tasks that gets you through the gateway and then you're suitable for promotion, but you have then... Like pools? Yeah. A bit. Well, not like pools because okay. I think everybody's on pools. So say Peter and Rob have both got through the gateway. Mm-hmm. So Peter and Rob are now given a project that they have to deliver over a 12-month period. They have to write papers to boards. They have Mm -hmm. to do all the finances Mm -hmm. around it. They have to do a trial, a test, a pilot, call it what you want. That is your promotion process. Mm. 
then at the end of the day, yes, suitable for promotion or needs further development, etc. Mm. Then the next time a job comes up, you get put into that job. It would be far more robust way of looking at an individual rather than a snapshot. And look, I've been through processes and I've, I've absolutely flunked them mm. because I had a bad day on the interview. Yeah. Does that mean... What hat syndrome's a thing? Well, and everybody goes through it, you know, and I think we lose some really motivated individuals by putting them through that very intense process of an hour to an hour and a half, and they put themselves under that much pressure. They don't, they're not the true selves, and I've seen it recently at strategic mm. manager level. Mm. So it's happening all the way through, but what do we do? We carry on on the same hamster wheel, yeah. expecting a different outcome. <laughs> <laughs> Don't repeat the same thing and expect again. a different run it outcome. Well, you know, it's, it's, yeah, run it again. Yeah. Um, do you ever do things like 360 feedback and yes. stuff in your service? Yeah, yeah. You do. Yeah, Thank yeah. God. So yeah. um, there's not many services I speak to that actually do it. Uh, I'm sure a lot do do it. There's yeah. lots of services I haven't spoken to. We used to do a lot in my old organisation, and I thought it was great yeah. because, like what you're saying there, a little bit around testing people's abilities and testing people's ability to deliver and their consistency and stuff like that. But also the biggest thing is certainly when we think about the culture of an organization, people's engagement is the effect you have on someone else. Yeah. So like we're both sat here now, you've got, I could make you write a page worth of one line. Yeah. Now, how have I done it? Okay. Maybe I could talk to you and cajole you and encourage you and we do it together. Or I could just shout at you repeatedly mm -hmm. until you've completed the page. Now the outcome will show that you have completed the page. But, you know, the the impact, my impact intended, I motivated Rob. Well, how did you motivate him, though? I just screamed at him. How did you find it, Rob? Hate him. Hate Pete. Never want to work with him again. It was horrible. So the th factor of 360 feedback, you know, someone that's working with you, someone that maybe is a, a subordinate or a team member, someone you've done a project with, these are very time-consuming. But they're they're very effective. But you say they, they do play a factor in, in how you do... Do they play I, a factor in process? Where do, what, where do they sit? No. We utilise them and we, we're developing, we've got a coaching and mentoring process. I'm mentoring a number of people at the moment, firefighter right up to, to group manager. Mm. Um, and it's about them understanding the entirety of their emotional intelligence, you know, and, and understanding the impact they have on others. What I always say when I say we're going to do a 360 is I want you to pick a number of people. Don't pick all your mates. Mm -hmm. Pick people. Pick somebody you've just had a bit of a conflict with because you'll get far richer feedback from that individual than you will mm. Peter, who's your mate. Yeah. You know, and I think very much within the sector, when they do 360s, people always go out to the friends and people. Mm. They've, now, you won't get the rich feedback. I think 360 plays a part. I also think, you know, the use of external coaches is really powerful. Definitely. Um, and and we're, we, we've created a high potential leadership program at all levels, grey and green book. Wow. Um, it wasn't brilliant in the first year, but the second year is going to be really useful. But the engagement of an external coach mm. and the feedback I've had from the candidates has been fantastic. Mm. Whether they're doing a project, whether they're getting ready for promotion, et cetera, et cetera, has been really good. And I think sector-wise, we don't utilise that enough. I know on the UK FRS website now, we've just launched a number of people products mm. and coaching and mentoring is one of those now yeah. that everybody can log on to and access a, a coach free of charge you know i would encourage as many people to access that as possible i've had coaching in the past you know for certain things and i think it, it's really good just to have a different set of eyes on things 100 percent. i think that uh I love what you say there around the, the soft skills because I always say to people that the soft skills are in fact the hard skills. We gravitate to what we know as hard skills like functional skills like instant command, command presence. Yeah, well, a lot of us, are. Uh, uh, I'm like a big meathead white male. So, you know, okay, command skills are probably going to come. That's my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. The hard skills are developing those soft skills. Mm -hmm. So, so how do we develop emotional intelligence? They always say the subtlety between obvious and oblivious is only very small. Mm -hmm. And for some people, you're just like, how can you not see the effect you're having yeah. on other people? How do you give them that awareness? I think it's it's difficult. You've got to be have strength in your own convictions that you're doing the right thing. Sometimes the difficult conversations people will shy away from. It's That's very true. easy to do. Now, you're not being true to that individual. You know, if, if somebody's talking in a room, but then everybody's talking about them in the corridor... You need to be the one that goes and sits down with that individual. Because mm -hmm. half the time, people are completely, as you say, oblivious to the impact they're having. 
Um, it's almost made 10 times harder as well because then when you do that, they go, well, no one else yeah, has said that, Rob. Exactly. And you're like, well, I know no one else has said it. And you don't want to start going there. Yeah. And you go, no one's said it to your face, yeah. but everyone's thinking it. And you're like, well, don't maybe don't say that. But, you know, <laughs> it's difficult for them because so many people have just avoided yeah. that And it's the same, so isn't it, man? You, if you end up in a discipline with somebody and you've got a whole five years worth of fantastic appraisals yeah. because somebody was scared of having the difficult conversation. You're absolutely taking the organisation's legs away. Yeah. And we see that time and time again. Mm. So it's about developing our supervisory managers to be able to understand that it's the right thing to do. If you nip things in the bud really quickly, you don't em- end up in an employment tribunal. Kill the monster while it's small. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and we don't do that. But then you look at the development programmes we put people through – Heavily weighted to incident command, all the easy things in my it saves mind. lives, Rob. That's what we do. Exactly. It saves lives. Yeah, I know, but lots of people are leaving because you're not treating them very nicely. Yeah, yeah. And, that, so and then the culture, there, right? the culture in the organisation is all of that. Yeah. That's, that, that stuff. And that actually, if you make the, the culture stronger, our ability to perform on the Instagram will be stronger yeah. as well because we'll be seamless. And so we'll going back to the first point about why we don't wear rank markings, actually, if somebody doesn't feel comfortable saying, Rob, I'm having a real difficult time and these are the reasons why, I'm never ever going to hear about it. Mm. Now, if they can't say it to me is one thing, but if they can't say it to their line manager, that's a real issue. Mm. And by creating that open environment, the safe environment where you can have really honest conversations, you'll get a better culture. It takes time and some people won't like it, but... Ten percent is always going to be that issue, yeah, you know. Yeah, and that's again. You, we, we work with a whole bunch of lovely, rich individuals that have come from a different upbringing. Do you know what I mean? But a lot of what we're talking about here is a little bit like parenting as well. And I'm certainly not a perfect parent. I, d- I doubt you are either. But I don't think anybody is. Um, in that, if your kids exhibiting a behaviour that you know full well, someone in your life is not going to like that. Yeah. Don't do that. You'd be doing them a disservice yeah. if you didn't go. My, my daughter Lily, you know, sometimes she do stuff, and I'd be like. Baby, don't do that. Yeah. Why? Because I know you think it's funny, or I know all you wanted to do there was tell me that you knew the right answer. But what you did is you interrupted your friend when she was trying to talk. Yeah, and I know you just wanted yeah. to impress me, or you knew you knew the answer, but I was talking to her, wasn't I? Yeah, it is, obviously, that's a very yeah. silly micro yeah. example, but the easy thing would be to go, absolutely right, you're great. That kid didn't know you're amazing, and and their kids are going to yeah, hate them. Yeah, yeah. They're going to hate them, and exactly. it's the same, you know. With that, and I think we life. do. We lose some of that. We put a uniform on and think, you know, every. But go back to that childhood bit. Mm. You know, the frustration I get sometimes is your kids when they're young, they're dead curious. You know, yeah. Dad, why? Dad, why does this happen? Gets knocked out of them when they come to school because they're then looking at the school's targets and all the rest of it. The curiosity goes. Now, we've got to think about that happens when we put this uniform on. Mm-hmm. It's just a different uniform. It's not a school uniform, but it's different. And I want to get back to, you know, getting people being curious, asking those why questions. And actually, the senior leader has been happy with that. Mm-hmm. If I go to watch visit and nobody's challenging me, I know I've got it wrong. Mm-hmm. I need them to be asking because you, you're damn sure that outside of me being there, they will be having those conversations yeah. around the mess table. Yeah. So let's have them with me. I'm not precious. You know, as I've said, I'm just Rob from Stoke trying to do a good job. Now, by opening up the conversation, we get a far richer picture of what's going on and what's causing a firefighter an issue or a a member of support staff an issue on a daily basis. I need to know about those. If I don't know about them, I can't do anything about it. Yeah, because with all the greatest respect, I'm throwing all of these ingredients into the mixer. And what I think is coming out the other end is this. If I'm coming out the other side of the machine and you go... It smells horrible. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it stinks. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. I, I'm tasting it and it is not good. And you're like, wow. Because honestly, that was not my intention. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? All the people I'm stood with around the other side, we feel like we're doing the best we possibly can. Yeah. But if it's not good, then we need to open it up. We need to get into the gubbins. Please help help me yep. understand. Be part of the understand. solution. Be part yeah. of the solution. That's, I, always, I always say to people, be, be an objective contributor. And what I mean by that is like, don't just be objective for the sake of being objective. Don't just throw stones for the sake of throwing yeah. stones. Don't come to me with a problem without a solution. I'm not saying we're going to go with yours. I'm not saying it's the best one. I'm not saying it's the worst one. If it's the only one, we might go with it. Yeah. And at least trial it. But don't just be objective. You know, don't, not recreational negativity for the sake yeah, of it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Some it's people almost just want to moan because it, it's, it's like... It's a sport that, to some people. It is. It is a sport. And you're just like, yeah, what would you do? It's above my rank. What do you, what do you mean it's above? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't get paid enough to solve these problems. 
the problem of why the food's horrible or the problem of why the kit doesn't work. You know, just ask you for an idea, mate. Mm. If we're at home, what would you do? If I'm like, okay, what would you do to solve it if you're at home, though? Because I know you said you just solve it, but what would you have done to yeah, just solve it? Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? It's, it's having those just, aspects to it. Yeah, yeah, and engaging with the workforce. Just engage with it, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just listen to them. So. Uh, you were all, as everybody else was in the UK, visited by HMI very recently. We are due to have Rob Wilshire uh, on in next month. I think he's coming on the podcast. Um, really fascinating. Really looking forward to asking lots of questions. How did you find the experience? Because it was jarring for some. Some didn't like the metrics. Some loved the metrics. I'm sure the ones that came out of standard loved the metrics. Yeah. How did you find it? So, um, obviously, we were inspected in 2018-19, the first inspection. And I, th I do think, you know, looking at all of the reports, and ours is due out next month, okay. um, the first round of inspections are very much a soft approach for HMI, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, I think this one will be far more accurate, potentially. You know what we're looking for now. So yeah, got, yeah, the, yeah, you know, the methodology is there. It's difficult because we were still in the middle of a pandemic, you know, and then to have things thrown at the organisation about numbers, well, we were under restrictions. We have to remind ourselves because now we're, you know, a sunny day in Staffordshire today. We're not wearing masks. We're up. You forget very quickly the restrictions 100%. that were in place. Yeah, so we yeah. need to be aware of that. Um, some good bits out of the first one, you know, but when you get an outstanding for culture and values, there's only one way to go mm. from there, and that's yeah. down. <laughs> that's that's a scary a, a thing, isn't it? Frustrating bit. Oh, that um, would worry me a little but bit. But equally, through a global pandemic, yeah, you know, yeah. the impact on culture is huge. Yeah. So we need to be aware of that. Yeah. Luke, what are you like at celebrating wins? Not I, you, per well, maybe you personally. Yeah, yeah, we well. should celebrate success. I'm all terrible the at time, it. You know, and uh, I think as a sector, we're really self deprecating. Um, I think as like you know, a, a, a Western that, world. That British, British mentality, isn't it? You it's know? not good. And I, you know, I'm really keen to. We did a, a bit of a cultural review uh, last year, went out to 46 face to face briefings. Um, virtually and um the feedback was people like to be recognized um staff recognition but they don't want a glitzy award ceremony we used to do that many years ago and yeah. they didn't like that it became very headquarters knowing centric. how people like to be rewarded because yeah. some people like you say on a watch culture it's like some want to be clapped on the parade yep. some would prefer hey man so we did that i really appreciate it. just a one-to-one -one. because you'll embarrass some yeah. people by calling them out to so congratulate I, them. after this peter i'm going to present a couple of long service awards at station because some people don't want to come up to the awards ceremony at headquarters. Now, yeah. it's their medal. Yeah. They can receive it however they want. It yeah. should be via uh, a representative of Queen, but the chief fire officer can do that. So I'm going to do it because they want it with their watch, with their colleagues on their station. Because they're, well, that, it sounds harsh, but they're the people they respect. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, some people don't want to be a thank you from a group manager exactly. they've never met. But if their watch or their team or their own chief, they, they're like... No, I really appreciate yeah. that. You know, just over a cup of tea and we'll yeah. have a chat. And, and so we've got to listen to people. So there's no point me going, doing the culture review and they say, I want this and I'll do something different. Yeah. So it's just about engaging with that, but also understanding that different people will want different things. Mm. We're very good at the sheep dip. Everybody has the same approach. Mm. We're all individuals. We're all unique. That's where I think fairness and equality can get a little bit mixed up. I always say treat everybody fairly, but don't treat them the same. No. Yeah. Because they're, they're not the same. Yeah, yeah, someone's yeah. going to hate it. Equity and, and equality are very different. That's what yeah, I'm yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah. And we have that. Like you say, we sheep dip and go, well, no, Pete, it's because you need to treat everybody yeah. fairly. No, no. I, I agree. Treat everybody fairly, but don't treat them the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, yeah. if we have different needs. We're all different. Things that are within our yeah. sphere of control, you can't ride a fire engine from home. Yeah. 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 You know, so <laughs> that's different from the person that works in HR. But yeah. we can still treat people fairly, exactly. but don't treat them the same. Yeah. Yeah. What were some of the outcomes that you, that you saw come from HMI? Because you had uh, Wendy Williams. Uh, I've not had opportunity to have a brief chat with her yet. But she did judge a servant as outstanding in promoting right values and culture. Um, how exactly did you do that? Because I'm sure there's a lot of services that will want to do that. And I know we may be covering a little bit of old ground in here, but if we were trying to try and capture it in a soundbite, and some of this will have come before you because cultures take years and years mm. to develop. I think there's probably more pressure on you now not to mess that up in the next, you know, whatever years that you're here. Yeah, and I do think, as I've said, I think we'll go backwards from there. I really do in this next um, inspection report. Um the culture within the organisation, you know, our not previous chief, but the chief before that, Peter Dartford, when he mm -hmm. came in, did a massive piece of work. Okay. Some, you know, it's 12 years ago now. So we're on that culture journey. It's still not where it needs to be. There's pockets of the organisation that, 
you know, sometimes elicit the wrong behaviours. So we deal with those robustly. We celebrate the successes. Mm. Um, and I think it's about being very open with people, actually not talking all of the time, but listening yeah. and considering how we can make their lives better, but being very honest as well. Yeah. We can't give everything to everybody that they want. But if you explain why you're doing something and the reasons and rationale behind it, then you're in a far better position than just doing it to people. Mm. And that engagement piece, you know, we're currently going around the whole organisation on a, it's called the financial challenge, mm. just explaining what challenge the organisation are under. Mm. Because if I say I have to cut this or I have to cut that and nobody understands why, then they just get frustrated. But if you say, well, this is the funding that we receive from central government, this is how it's changing, these are additional demands, you know, the the recommendations for Grenfell and the Building Safety Act, Mm -hmm. all of those are a demand that wasn't there before, we need to manage that. Because these numbers are so big, we don't really have the ability to comprehend them. And when we don't know the full story, we we all, as a human nature, we fill in the blanks. Because someone goes, you've got whatever, 10 million, 3 million, 1 million, and they go, you've got more than a million pounds and you cut in a fire. So they see the beginning and they see the end. And they go, there's a big blank in the middle. And they go, why? Because Rob's a horrible guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because Rob hates us. And you go, well, you don't, we don't quantify. A million pounds is just so much money to some people. You know, we're just like, that must pay for everything, surely. And you're like, it doesn't go as far as you think it does. No, and and unless... (laughs) How much do you think staff is cost? You know, how much do you think this costs? Unless you see the detail of it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's why we go out, we engage with the workforce. So they've got that understanding and actually... Most people realise, you know, I've come from an operational background. I was a firefighter. I understand it. Mm -hmm. You know, why would I? And that's what we need to keep the organisation going. We're a fire and rescue service. Mm -hmm. You know, if we had an unlimited amount of money, then, yeah, we'd be doing things differently. We haven't, but we've got to make sure everybody understands the reality of where we're at. Um, And that way, that is part of the culture senior managers going out and speaking to people and not, you know, being adversarial all of the time. Just mm-hmm. chat like you would chat. Yeah, with yeah, home. yeah, yeah. You've got to be able to say the same thing again and again and not get defensive. Yeah, yeah. And be Good. personable, you know. Mm. As I said, actually, we all know, and you will have known in your service, that something's been implemented. And on day one, the whole organisation was saying, that's a really bad idea. Yeah. But because a senior officer's name's associated with it, five years later, you'll go to the same set and we're still going, yeah, it's still a bad idea. Mm -hmm. But because the senior manager hadn't got the wherewithal to say, hands up, it was a rubbish idea, let's scrap it. Mm. They've carried on. It just perpetuates that negativity within the organisation. And, you know, I make mistakes every single day Mm -hmm. and I'm happy to publicly say that because... How do you say that? Exactly that. So... On our weekly bulletin, I did something the other day about we, some years ago, stopped some of the community activities that we did, you know, going to the local fair or fete or whatever, for whatever reason. And Mm. it was done at the time. So in our newsletter two weeks ago, I said, I think that was a mistake. Mm. Community engagement should be at the forefront of whatever we do. And if it's a crew having an ice cream with a community group, so be it. Brilliant. That's community engagement. Yes, you haven't stuck a smoke detector. Some of that's very intangible. That's the problem. And I try, I'm working with our, um, our engagement team at the minute as part of some of our community ambassadors and trying to help them because they're oh, we've got to have a metric, Pete. And I'm like, yeah, well, what about if we just had something like number of times you've been? Um, did you go in person or was it via the phone? Did you speak, even if you spoke to the same person four times, we, we, we tend to do a smash and grab, which so is like, my question go, to you. give us an address. Whoa, hang on a minute, you've just met me. But my question to you on that, Pete, and I, I went to a really good lunch and learn event with the um, the new uh, head of the Muslim Council of Great Britain. Yeah. Um, firstly, a complete change. Uh, all previous incumbents had been male. Okay. She's a female. All previous incumbents had been 55 plus. She's in her 20s. Nice. Really insightful individual. So I asked her about, you know, why can't we get more people from the Muslim community come and join the fire and rescue service. She said, Rob, you've got a great value proposition, the fire and rescue service, but you're really crap at marketing. I said, let's dig into it a bit. She says, well, you only ever come to us when you want something. And she said, if you think about how you build relationships outside of work, and we've all got them, haven't we? The the phone number that goes on your phone, I think, 
they want yeah. something again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how the phone rescue suit. She said, you'll That's knock great. on the, the door to the mosque when you're recruiting. You'll leave some leaflets. And then we never see you again. That isn't how you build a relationship. Why don't you get the people together, just share food? You know, have a meal at the fire station or go into the mosque and have a meal. That Don't even talk about the fire station. I think the police, actually, as much as they're they don't do everything better. great, they're so much better far at this. Better. You know, you see a couple of them standing yeah. outside the mosque. And, like, for us, if we saw a fire engine stood somewhere, you'd, again, people out of an old mindset sometimes would go, just stood around. What are they doing? Or even if they're just talking with a few people, how many leaflets did you hand out? But we're just there. You, you don't, we're just talking. We're just the metric right can be, is that an engagement tick? Yes, yeah, you've got it. it. Is, yeah. And if you have 10 engagements, I'm happy. Yeah, because yeah. actually, that is your community. They are the risk within the community. The building, yeah, is one thing. But actually, buildings don't self-combust. It's when you put the people inside the building. <laughs> exactly. That's the issue. Yeah. So why don't we build the relationship with yeah. the people? Yeah. And that's what we're changing. So that even now. when they've got a whisper of a concern or even a flickering of a question... The barrier to accessing that is so small because they'll go, to I'll ask Rob. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll ask Sarah because I saw her the other week. I've got a number. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. Rather than, do you think somebody should ring Staffordshire Fire and Rescue Service? And, and they're like, away. who is that? I don't know. It's yeah. a number make at headquarters. It, make it personal. Take away this scary, the service, the organisation because people won't contact that. Mm. And make it one-to-one personal contact. Yeah. And I think that way... You'll understand. They'll open up to you very, very quickly that there aren't who's living alone, has got hoarding issues, is drinking every night. Actually, that's the information we need, and then we can go in and do it. But if you haven't got the relationship in the first place, yeah. you won't get that access. Yeah. So that's why we need to change the way we're doing things. 100%. I love and it. And crews love getting out and doing that. They love oh, yeah. speaking to the school kids. They love going to the squirting the water and... And we've lost some of that because we went very much binary, metrics, all the rest of it. So I just think that engagement piece, and I'm really keen to really, over the next few years, that's going to yeah. ramp up. We're not throwing the baby out of the bathwater. It just needs that recalibration. You know, yeah, the yeah. pendulum swings yeah, really yeah. far one way, and you're like, I okay, a, I understand it. Swing I've it been a reading a really good book um, recently, and it's um, called Belonging, and it's about high-performing teams. Not and about yeah, yeah, it's and real, I'm big into my yeah, book, yeah. so I'm going to write that down. Give you a copy of we'll it. put uh, we'll put it in the notes of the podcast yeah, yeah. as well, so people. Um, can. And he's talking about um, a number of things. He's worked with the All Blacks. He's worked with the England football team. All the rest of it. But he did say a Who lot. Is it? Do you know? Um, I'll get his name because we were having Damien Hughes on the podcast. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. he's I'll, from. Um, I'll get it to you after I've got it. To he's from the High Performance definitely. Podcast, and he's yeah. Well, there's some. I, what, I listened to that High Performance Podcast. Oh, really yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. I met him the other week and asked him, yeah. and I was like, "For the most services, yeah, absolutely." Yeah. I was like, "Dude, wow!" Yeah, yeah. But I love what you said there about you said something about being more personable. And several times here, again, with, with watches and stuff like that, you've said about taking down those barriers. And mate, that is kind of the entire point of this podcast. It's like be more human yeah, yeah. it's not what I mean try and strip that away because you know the reason I joined the reason so many people join the services is because they didn't necessarily read a leaflet and they didn't hear a, a, something on the radio they met someone yeah. they knew so and so they knew John they knew Sally that worked at the station do you know what I mean and yeah. they just heard a story from them and yeah. they got to meet them now we can get so clinical and so professional we'll use the word professional but professional doesn't mean cold no. professional doesn't mean clinical professional means like competent trustworthy yeah. you know you know the ability to do the job that we want you to do you don't have to be so shiny and rigid and cold because yeah. people can't connect with that it's very difficult for them I I often say that, you know, and I've seen it with people that were really good uh, on the watch, on the watch management, and then they got promoted and they changed overnight. Mm. They became this wooden, they, they tried to be a, something that they weren't, and they just undermined their own credibility overnight. Yeah. I see it far too many times. And this stuffiness of, you know, like you say, when you get a rank and when you get a role that they change, I, I just think we need to get away from that. I am just me. I'll do the best job I possibly can do and I'll tell you when I don't know something, I'll tell you when I can't do it because I'm not going to undermine myself. You know, you just mm. look stupid. You just What was your most difficult move? Because some people say it's firefighter crew is the um, most difficult. Some people have said, no, it's this or that. It's difficult to say which is the most difficult. I think they all come with their own challenges. Yeah. You know, being a firefighter is challenging and has its own level of stress, the same as being chief. They're just on different levels, mm. not one more important than the other. They're just at that time. They're, they're difficult. I think the biggest change coming off shift, you realise mm. that you've got very limited time. You know, I think the shift system is fantastic. 
you know, I was able to bring me, my son up, I was pick him up from school and all the rest of it, out to school club, all the rest of it, it was great. Mm. You then get into a level where, you know, now my phone hasn't been off. My telephone hasn't been turned off for eight, nine years. Really? Yeah, when you become a PO, it's on, you're 24-7, you're on continuous duty. Do you, do you not have it, and again, I'm not too personal, but... Is there any way you don't have it? Do you have it in your bedroom, for yes. example? Do you? Yeah. Dude, really? Do you yeah, have to? Yeah. Well, in my role, yeah, because if something goes wrong, I need to know about it. And you know, Are you going to be able to fix it at three in the morning? I need to be aware of it. Okay. I don't need to fix everything, but what I don't want is any Surely surprises. Surely you're on a rotation. Yeah, Surely we're on a rotation. with your principal well, officers, and, and one, of you, one of you can do I'm it, and the, other, the others so can have an unplug. If you think Manchester Arena happens, yeah, yeah. Grenfell happens, yeah. At the end of the day, I know I'm going to be in the public inquiry. 100%. I need to know about it. Yeah. What, about you're saying six hours after was the first time you were made aware of it? Exactly. Uh, I need to uh, make sure. And it, look, you take it on. That's part of the role. You accept that. But as I said, every role within the service has its own challenges, and I wouldn't diminish any of those. Um, they're all difficult in their own right. You never feel ready for the next step. Really? Yeah, yeah. You always think, can I do it? Because you feel like a fraud, like going from before you're ready. But if you waited till when you're ready, have you yeah. waited too long? If you wait till you're ready, you'll never be ready because you'll always find uh, something. That well, everything's says, always changing really, as well, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. So you, every oh, day you can that. go, oh, God, I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. Well, you're not going to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, it's a bit like learning <laughs> to swim, isn't it? I have that sometimes <laughs> like when you go for a promotion process and you think you need to know everything about the job that you're going for. And I try to learn a lot of stuff. And then I, and then I added like something clicked to like three years ago where I was like, actually, no. Because when they ask me that, and they've asked me a few times, they've gone, oh, tell me an example of this that you would do in this role. I said, I don't know at the minute. Um, I anticipate I'll get that training. But from my limited interpretation right now, this is what I think I would do yeah. or something like that. But I want us to shift away from that because, like you say, I'd rather hire a mindset than a skill well, set. I, I can the, teach you a skill set. And some of the bits you asked about, you know, what should we do differently or do more of or less mm. of in recruitment, I think we need to get away from that. And it really frustrates me is tell me about a time when you've coped under pressure. And they'll, they'll wax lyrical about how great they are. <laughs> I can't validate it, <laughs> particularly at recruitment stage. Yeah, I've never met them before. Exactly, yeah, you yeah. Know, and they might have just said they got a friend who's been through it and these yeah, are the questions. Yeah. Mate, they're on the internet. You can, you can download up. and insert different words but into some it. some more value-based discussion yeah. or examination of an individual will be far stronger mm. And the, the irony that we, we do these processes, we don't actually talk to the individual till one of the last bits of the process. Yeah. And they could be an absolutely, you know, wrong horrific individual yeah, that is person. never going to align to your values and your, your, your culture. Mm. And we've wasted all this time on them. They've gone through the binary processes of, you know, tests online and all the rest of it. You haven't even spoken to them. So surely we need to flip that round and just I've have a chat. I've done some, some great pieces of work for organisations, and even one of the organisations I actually worked for when we used to run recruitment processes there, we would still do like team building games. There mm -hmm. was like a plank game where you had a certain amount of time to orientate these things. To certain, and some people do different things about building certain things. And I think they're great examples because mm -hmm. it's to see which, which member of this team, that you don't. some people all think they need to scramble to be in charge of it. But I think that some of the best ones are like, who was the person that started the stopwatch? Yeah. Who was the person that went, oh, yeah. 10 minutes is what we've got, right? I'm going to start yeah. 10 minutes. That was the person where they stood out on the side because everyone went to snatch for the yeah. whistle or everyone snatched for the materials to build something. And I I'm think, like, that person there was one of the real keepers. They're passed straight away almost. We went through a process or a time, period of time in the sector that I think recruitment was, we're trying to recruit chief fire officers. Yeah. Or not. We need a good, solid base the firefighters crew and watch Tell me about the structure of the UK Fire and Rescue Service. I've no idea. Yeah. <laughs> Nor should I. Yeah. I'm not applying to be a firefighter. Doesn't matter, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that, that strong base of people that want to be firefighters yeah. for the next 30 years, that's great. Yeah. That's fantastic. Don't diminish that. No way. And I think some people have looked badly on that. Well, no way. Without that strong group of individuals, we've got no organisation. Society's organization. built on them. We've got no organisation. That yeah. is the organisation. Don't diminish it in any way. What made you want to join? It was funny. I was working as a fitness instructor in a gym, local gym in, in Stoke. God, and you're not another one of them, are you? Two guys. <laughs> two guys were in the gym all of the time. I was like, have you got a job? <laughs> and uh, they were whole-time firefighters at Hanley Fire Station. So we got chatting and they said, come down. Come down uh, tomorrow night. So I went down. Had a look. I never even considered the fire service. The way they were so passionate about their role yeah. just got me hooked. 
And I thought, wow, it's amazing. They, they saw, they talked professionally about it. They knew the community, they knew the risk. They were dead professional. The kit they were showing me, I was like, wow, they are up there, you know, mm. in terms of a community individual. 100%. So they supported me in applying. They told me when the application was going in the great. And, you know, the two of they both just retired, actually. And our, at their retirement dues, I spoke to them about it. They influenced my life massively. Yeah. And I respect them, you know, because that's, superb individuals. Mate, you're so right. And again, it's not a bloody sales pitch, but like that's the whole thing of the podcast. I'm like, if you could have shared the conversation they shared with you with another yeah. thousand people, yeah. I'm like, that's why people want to join because because then they can make a connection. Yeah. Like for, with the greatest respect, people look at you now and probably very few people will be able to make a connection, not because yeah. you're not human or anything like that, but the, it, you're so far away from starting the fire service. Yeah. People will be like, oh, that's that. but when people hear... Oh, so I was just a fitness instructor in a thing, or I just did this, or I used to be a plumber, or I used to be, you know, I used to work in HR, or like we've had people join from the prison service, or you know, the carers for their parents, like that. And you're like, wow, okay, wow, I can now see a route between yeah. where I am yeah. uh, and where Make you are. Make it real. Make the connection mm. and demonstrate. You know, I left school with two O levels. Mm. I school didn't interest me at all. Education didn't. I was doing my sport, and you know, I've now got to a position. I've uh, I've graduated from three different universities. If I'd have gone to university at 18, I'd have got a bad head and a bad liver and nothing more. I wouldn't have got a degree at the end of it because it didn't do, mean had anything. a big debt, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Bless but them. I think if you can demonstrate that do your education when it means uh, something. Once I'd got that click, that actually I well, can see why, the relevance of this education. If you can understand the why, yeah. you can fall in love with it. Far better. And if you can tell young people that have probably done poorly at the GCSEs, actually, you can make something because we put so much pressure on young people that I don't even know today what I want to do when I grow up. I know you know, and we're, ask, we're asking people at 15, 16 to make a, a life-changing decision and your life isn't written off at that time. You know and what? we need those stories to come out. I heard a great thing the other day, and I can't remember it was, and I'm sure I'm going to butcher it to death, but you know, we have so many young people now and they feel so lost and they, they come to us and ask for answers. First, we give them the empty box of autonomy, which is, it's up to you. You can do whatever you want. And they look in the box and they go, God, there's there's nothing in there for me. And they throw it away. And next one, you give them the book of the bucket of endless opportunity. And they yeah. go, oh, so I can do absolutely anything. And I'm my own. Okay. And that one's empty as well. And we don't give them any tangible, like for them to hear your story and go, okay, so that is a recognizable route. Or it's not like a strategic direction, strategy versus tactics. They're like, this is a rough five lane highway of where someone has gone. Mm. And if I do a little bit of something like that in my own way, I might choose a different lane and I might go a different route. But that's something I might be able to do. But when we just say, do anything you like, go for it. Now tell me what you're going to be in five years. Mm. And they're like, <laughs> what? I, I, I've no idea. That's it. And it, it, I think by we almost make out that you've got to know at 16 what you're going to do when you're Also, there's 10,000 options now. You know, when we were kids, there was like 10, 15, yeah, 20 yeah, options. Yeah. Do you want to be a builder, nurse, doctor, yeah. train, work in a factory? Now, do you want to make radiators? Do you yeah. want to be a TikTok influencer? Exactly. Do you want to make hats for cats? You know, there's a, you can do a bajillion things, a YouTuber. So we get paralyzed, that paralysis of analysis. What made you fall back in love with it? Not fall back in love, that might be a bit romantic. But like, because we have a lot of mature students joining the fire service now. People aren't all joining at 18. Some are joining at 30, 40, 50. Yep. What made you continue to want to develop? When did you go back to uni? How old okay, were you? Okay, so I, I did five years as an operational firefighter just because I, I came into it, I loved it. I wanted to learn as much as I could. Um, after And I, <laughs> it's funny when I got the chief's job, my dad, text me and said can you remember telling me you were never going for promotion because i just loved the uh, role of the firefighter yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah and i'll be dead honest Captain's i got alive, yeah yeah i got after five years i got bored um a colleague was going for his leading firefighters exams he said do you want to study with me and i said yeah go on then you know i just thought yeah i'll help him you know and he reignited some of the um passion the you know and well, yeah, yeah i was like yeah i'm being stretched again i like being stretched Everybody um, does secretly yeah, to yeah. different degrees. I no think doubt. you get very. You, you go onto a watch, and that becomes your world. Green Watch Newcastle was my world. <laughs> okay. you know? I got all these experienced individuals that I thought, oh, I'll be as good as them one day. Yeah. And then they were leaving, and all of a sudden, you're the elder person on the watch, and you think, oh, okay, now I need stretching. And I think the advice I'd give to anybody, and I do give to people, is 
move around the service. Yeah. The and service is far bigger than what you say. No, because no. some people join your station and they're the only person that's there after 15 years and they're like, oh yeah, good old Greenwatch yeah, yeah, Newcastle. Yeah. And you're like, dude, there's no one there from when yeah, you were there. Yeah. And not because, oh yeah, well they went for promotion. No, well so-and-so went, do you know what, I'm going to join a water station because I've never done that. Safety, I fancy a bit of that. that. Yeah, 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 I'm going to do a bit of community educator work because I've never done that and I want a bit of a change. You just, you, you can't harp it. And now you become the negative person. Yeah, you yeah. become the person. Not like it used to be. Tell you what, <laughs> my old gaffer from 15 years and you're like, dude, yeah. let it go. That yeah. person you speak about, they're still just as passionate but they moved and yeah, they, yeah. they're working with a new team in fire protection. They're exactly. working with a new team on Red and Watch, how many times Times Scotland. do you see it? How many times do you see it that actually the person that was saying, "Oh, Green Watch Newcastle," when they do move, they're like, "Wow!" Wish, I, wish, I'd, 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 wish I'd, I'd done it five years ago. Ten years ago, yeah. 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 <laughs> I've just had it with somebody in L and D. You know, know yeah, yeah. But yeah. but make that step. The organisation is a big, enjoyable place with loads of opportunity. Mm. You've just got to take them. You know? mm. I wanted to ask you, and I remember writing it down before. I was just looking at my notes about the growing waistline, as I'm calling it, of the UK. Uh, residency or just the Western world as a whole. Now, we, ha- we don't want to have this whole elitist thing about um, fitness standards and all that sort of stuff. I mean, you're a chief fire officer. Why, why on earth are you still in shape? Why, you know, do, you, do you think you're better than someone? Do you know why? Why have you kept in such great? Do we need to? So I've um, got fitness a, standards have changed, and my background is from elite sport. So um, from the age of kind of twelve onwards, I've been heavily involved in exercise. Um, what sort of sports did you do? So I was a international gymnast. Um, wow. So I won a Commonwealth Games. How did I not see that when I was Googling I it? I don't know. I won a, <laughs> a medal in the Commonwealth Games in 94. Um, I was reserve at Olympics in 92. Um, so yeah, yeah, I... Dude, that's awesome. embedded in my <laughs> life. So, and the other thing, I, I you know, I exercise every what, day. What, what gymnastics? What, what? So artistic, so the floor, the pommel horse, rings, vault, parallel bars, high bar. Wow. Um, so all of those, yeah, yeah. National champion. Ever any, ever any big injuries? So, oh, yeah, yeah. I've broken most of the bones in my body. Uh, oh, yeah. dude. Yeah, significant. That's sending me down another massive yeah. rabbit hole now. <laughs> I mean, because I, I competed internationally for, on a couple of different sports, and I think there is a real missing link in society at the minute between some of the, of the characteristics mm. that we get, even from whatever, you know, just five aside or... Yeah. Netball, but whatever you might do, any even if it's a singular thing like exercise, like working into a gym, it teaches you lots of characteristics oh, there's, there's around so personal much around discipline, around you know discipline, leadership, being part of a team, all transferable skills to many many occupations, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, I think we miss that. But coming back to the question, I do think that society is changing. You only have to walk down the street and see how many obese people there are. You know, I went into the hospital a few weeks ago. And I didn't realise they have, you know, um, bariatric chairs in every waiting room now. Mm. And you think, right, okay, so we're not uh, exempt from that as a sector. And we need to make sure that we put everything in place to allow well, our Also, personnel. you haven't really got to have a massive amount of data to say the people most likely to get stuck in these houses are probably the people that are less mobile. Yeah. Who's less mobile? People who are ill, infirm, or people that via their own physical size or disability can't get themselves well, Mobility, out. so we've got a... a, a a mnemonic same so smoking alcohol mobility in the elderly mm. one of those four risk factors has been present in every fire fatality of the last 15 years I've now seen that on the what we need to do is look at each of one of those as the root cause of the incident you know fire is very often the symptom so we're looking how can we influence an impact upon those root causes rather than just treating the symptom and putting the fire out um, so but our workforce needs to equally think of fitness as a lifestyle choice. You know, well-being is How do we encourage that and not be elitist, though? I think you have to put the facilities... You know, we put gyms on every station. We give people time in the working day to be able to allocate All to... All staff? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we're this room that we're in at headquarters is going to be changed into a gym. Yeah, yeah because Beautiful equally... The, yeah, the, the headquarters here, if anybody's never been, is gorgeous. Yeah, yeah it's a lovely, it's <laughs> it's a lovely place. A lovely, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, like it's a, it's a beautiful run-up to it. It's a, it's a great it's, place to work. It's a really nice place to but, work. But, you know, for all of our support staff should be able to maintain 100%. their health and well-being you yeah. know there's no as i said they're still part of the team we should be able to give I access think there's to a, people have this assumption and again why well, i think the fire service is so great people think it's the same for all emergency services mm. i was speaking to loads of police officers a lot of them don't have gyms mm. some of them that have gyms have had to fund them all themselves yeah. i don't think and i'm sure i'm gonna be proven wrong 
I'm going to say maybe a few, but I don't think any of the paramedic stations have gyms on them. I don't yeah. think they do. The thing is with paramedics, they're never in the stations. So oh, no, busy, bless them. You know, so. But yeah, if yeah. we have the ability to do it, exactly. so you give them the tools, yeah. um, obviously you provide them with the training should they want it. How else do we encourage it in such a noisy so we, world now? We, we're we yeah. just going, I've just developed a number of staff networks and I've also asked for reps on every station, every department to be the single point of contact. They get some basic training around fitness, okay. nutrition, health and well-being, mental health support. So they're the go-to person that, you know, people aren't going to necessarily come to me and say, I've got an issue, and I'm struggling with my mental health. But they will go to a colleague or a peer on that station. Yeah. might be on a different watch, but as, as long as there's one on every location, mm -hmm. and we'll give them that level of, of training and support. And I think that way then we start that. Actually, it's the right thing to do. We've got information and resources on the intranet about healthy eating, about sleeping well, about, you know, circadian rhythms, things like that. Oh, really? And make sure that they've got the tools that they need to be able to look after themselves. Mm. Because as a society, oh, easy for me to say, as a society, <laughs> I do think that we've become like chicks in the nest waiting for the mum to drop food into the mouths. We have. Yeah, we need yeah, to be yeah, more yeah. self-reliant and self-sustainable. Mm -hmm. Our communities need that. Yeah. And um, rather than the fire service being a heroic it. leader, yeah. let them become empowered to look after themselves. Mm -hmm. well, like you said, like we said before, you know, information, you know, the phone I've got sat in front of me now, it's never been so accessible to mm -hmm. us. What we're starting to lack is that muscle of grabbing hold of it ourselves, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, empowering ourselves, that, taking responsibility for your own physical and mental and professional development. You know, that's what I said it. before, Peter, it's about that curiosity. Yeah. You know, now for a curious individual in 1970, it was very difficult to go out and get the information. Yeah. You were taking a bus to the library yeah, exactly. 20 minutes away. Yeah, if an you hour, could. If, if you, you could. could. Yeah. Now, we've got it at our fingertips, but the curiosity is gone. Lead a horse to water. Yeah. So <laughs> curiosity <laughs> and creativity is where we need to go. I love it. So within that, sort of zooming out a little bit in terms of selection standards and things like that, having acknowledged that we know the growing waste on the public, do you think, and maybe it's not a Staffordshire question, do you think that's going to change? Do you think it should change if we're dragging... I mean, man, handling regs have changed since when I joined, definitely probably since when you joined. Um, should it change? Should we learn how to manoeuvre casualties that are heavier? I know we've got, like, casual handling straps and things like that, but do we need to raise the standards of fitness? Should this say where they are? I don't know. Should, think, we, should we do swimming again? Should we do... I don't know. What, I think what do they're you think? All, all of the, they shouldn't be barriers for entry. Okay. Because they are skills that can teach to somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no issue with that. Should be based around the risks that we're facing in our localities. There's no problem around that. Um, but I don't think you need to overemphasize it. I think you need a base level of fitness that everybody maintains. Yeah. Um, somebody will just keep the nose above the water. And my frustration is, you know, and we're just introducing by yearly fitness test because i've seen people because they have one fitness test a year getting fit for the test mm -hmm. and then reverting to type straight after yeah. well that's not a lifestyle change that's a big nine that's month worse. gap yeah of... that's worse for people's health yeah. than it is in terms of, of improvement so i think we just need to I get don't that know cultural if again i'm not bashing them but i think the police do one fitness test well their fitness standard is a lot lower as well i, I think they do one and then that's it. I don't know if they do annual. I'm sure yeah. I'm probably wrong there, but I know they're used to. And like for me in that job, I mean, like in our job, yeah, I might die in a fire. Not so, not diminishing that, which would scare me. But what would scare me more is if I know someone may attack me yeah. as part of my expected day-to-day -day job. I'd be like, oh, gee, I've got well, They fit. are running around. I've got to learn jujitsu. They, jiu they <laughs> are running around. They're wrestling with people. <laughs> they're getting punched, stabbed, kicked, shot at on a daily basis. Absolutely. And their standard is lower than ours. Mm. So I, I think we just need to be realistic mm -hmm. about the role. You know, 2018, we had a significant wildfire and it was very physically demanding. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have to be conscious and cognizant that actually these things, albeit they are reducing in frequency, they do occur. I want to do a little bit of reflection as, as we start sort of closing our conversation around uh, advice, thoughts, reflections on a few different things. So so before you moved into this role uh, that you're in now, was there anything that you didn't know about? I'm sure there's a lot of things you didn't know about the role, but is there anything that you wish you'd have known before you moved into it? Was there anything that you wish you'd have been armed with? Um, was there any difference between when you joined it? Because, you know, I don't want to yeah, say it's, it's poison chalice, but like, 
harder to seek guidance at, at CFO role? I think role, it's, um, it? it's not just as a CFO role, I'd say, as a principal officer. Um, you know, I, I started, I did a temporary in 2014, and I've carried on since then to today. Um, some of the things that you don't expect is, you know, social media is a cesspit, and there's some... Oh there's some really nasty people on social media yeah. that will troll you, put your picture all over social media, call you all kinds of things that family, friends, colleagues will all see and then get very concerned about you. It's fine for me because... Have you experienced that person? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Trolling on, on social media that's been horrific. And when Why? You know, based around the performance of the service or based around an incident? About incidents, just, you know, um, when the, there's been fatalities. And you are the and, figurehead to yeah, an yeah, extent, so they being, see you as the <laughs> fault. Not diminishing it, but being called a murderer on social media does have an effect. Imagine. And when you, your parents ring you and say what's going on, you know, it, it's... They, did, they didn't sign up for this, you no, know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I did. I've come into it with open eyes. So some of those, you know, things about maintaining your own well-being is really important. And my advice to anybody and the, the people that I'm mentoring at the moment, I'm just saying, you know, as soon as you step off of a, a station of watch, you, people are, who you thought that were your friends are very quick to stab an, a knife in your back. So mm-hmm. just be aware of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you find out who your true friends are as you progress through an organisation. No There's doubt, no doubt yeah. about that. So my advice for anybody is go into it with your eyes wide open. You know, you're there. You're going to be shot at. You're not going to make people happy. People are going to say things in various channels that will hurt you and your family. Um, but just be aware of it. You know, at the end of the day, I go to the gym. I can hit the boxing bag a lot harder sometimes yeah. on some days more than others. Different motivations. You know, so it's just, you've yeah. just got to be aware of it. Yeah, it's a big aspect of mental yeah. and physical wellness, as Lola, yeah, yeah. said. Um, I wanted to ask you around, now you just said that, the role that we should or shouldn't play in social media, perhaps. I mean, you're sat here on a, on a, on a podcast, which for some people is absolutely scary. You never know what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do with it. Oh, God, did you say something off air, blah, blah, blah. I always, I always try and encourage people to be part of the narrative. The story's getting told. Yeah. Story's getting told no matter what. And this is kind of it with the whole like, emergency services for us. We'll successfully do ourselves into obscurity if we don't stay part of the conversation. Let the public know what we're doing. So obviously I sit in a bias of I'd love us to be more involved in social media, open up the doors a little bit more, show people what we do on fire stations, or even if we haven't got shirts on. Oh, God, yeah, even if we haven't got shirts mm-hmm. on. Even if the kit's a little bit dirty. Yeah, even if the kit's it's just come back from a job and it looks filthy. Well, show them, yeah. show them cleaning it. You know, whatever, I don't care. You know, open the doors a little bit more. Um, scares a lot of people to death. Why, yeah. why are you sat here today? Why, what role do you think it's services you, should play? It's as you said, Pete, the story's going to get told. So why don't I influence the story? Yeah. Um, it's exactly the same as when I first, you know, when you first become an incident <coughs> commander and big incident and the media turn up. And I saw some people put them behind the barriers, don't talk to them. I'll go over and speak to them and say, right, what do you want? Mm-hmm. I can't deal with you now, but we'll we'll give you what you want in a little bit of time. And I think if I can influence that, then I'll do it the same on my day-to-day activities. Yeah. You know, people will put stuff on me, social media, people will do things, so I'll be involved in it. Um, it the accessibility to the service should be there. Do it in the right way and control it as much as you can um, because that way you can influence a little bit. Yeah. You're not going to solve the problem, but... Try and influence the wor- they, they can be your best friend, or you not know, be best friend, yeah. but they can certainly be your worst enemy. They just want their 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Go and talk to them, yeah, because otherwise they'll go, oh, God, I've got a job to do. They're not talking to me. I'll tell you what, all right, I'll talk to the public. Yeah. Uh, what have you seen? I don't know, I've just seen firefighters stood around doing nothing. Yeah. Fire keeps be getting bigger, and I don't think they're doing something with water. It doesn't look like I've got enough water. Oh, yeah, local yeah. public say the fire service haven't got enough water. Yeah, yeah. Go and talk go to them. Go and talk to them. <laughs> Explain. Yeah. I remember seeing one, uh, in fact, it was the service I, w- I was part of, um, they had some YouTuber, really famous YouTuber, had been to one of their stations. I don't know if you ever heard about this. And uh, they'd gone up to the station, recording it, obviously, and uh, nobody was there. They knocked on all the doors. I think the crew were there, yeah. but nobody there. And they went through the bins because they were just doing a community yeah, yeah, thing. They were like, hey, guys, we're here at this station. Um, let's see what the fire service do. And they came, knock, came, knock, went through the bins and said, oh, there's some of this stuff there, some of this stuff there. Well, it looks like the fire service don't want to talk to us, but uh, stay tuned for blah, blah, blah. And it came out and they sent a link in, our, in their like um, corporate newsletter. 
and said, if you're approached by any, do not engage, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And I'm like, why? Mm. If I'd have seen them, I'd have opened the door and gone, hello, mate, you're all right. Mm. And even if they'd have gone, oh, God, we're about to get thrown off. How you doing, mate? You know, and just ask him, ask him, have you got a working smoke alarm, buddy? Do you know what I mean? I and he goes, oh, we're just one of the, cool. Do you want to come and look at one of the fire engines? What do you want to talk about? And we just need to give people the support and the tools to be able to deal with that in a professional manner. Yeah. You know? um, because I do think, you know, we've had issues. Did you have a look at the Block Bridge agenda? Sorry to interrupt no, you no, there. No, There's a great meter training tip, and it's such a small thing, but it's such an easy one, which is Block Bridge agenda. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I always yeah. say to people, when they say, uh, what can you tell us about the seven deaths at Staffordshire's latest job? And you go, well, that sounds like a question for the chief fire officer. But what I can tell you is all of our crews are, de- are trained to deal with those sorts mm-hmm. of incidents. So we are prepared for an incident like that, should it happen in the yeah, future. Yeah, yeah. Block, bridge back to your agenda, yeah, straight yeah, back to your strategy. Block, I think that's a question for so-and-so. Yeah, yeah, that's probably yeah, a good exactly, question for yeah, the strategic yeah, manager. Yeah. That's a good question for UK Fire and Rescue. So just say that. But what I can tell you is, because I want to tell you something. What I can tell you is we're trained, we're prepared. What I can tell you is we actually get trained in mental health. What I can tell you is we've been out training this morning. There's always something to say. And I think that's where we need to give, you know, we do media training at different levels. We need to do it throughout the organisation. Because you will get the amount of people now with the telephone on YouTube, whatever. Everyone's a reporter. Yeah, yeah. You know, we've got devices clipped to our shirts now and it's recorded. There's cameras at every incident, (laughs) isn't there, you know? Leadership. I wanted to one of the closing things. We've spoken loads of aspects there around mentoring. You do up and down the service now. From great leaders that you've worked with in the past, you know, and, and, and maybe things you try and replicate in your day-to-day role or things you try and encourage, what are some of the greatest characteristics that you've seen in the leaders that you've worked with? Firstly, I'll kind of qualify this statement. I think that I've seen some of the best leaders within this organisation as firefighters. Mm. Not with the rank on, but they have. They've got, how I call it, they've got the dressing room. They're credible. They listen to people. They take the time to understand their team. And actually, they are some of the best leaders that I've seen throughout the organisation. Some of the worst leaders I've seen have probably got some <laughs> scrambled egg on the shoulders. Yeah. You know, I'll be dead honest. Yeah, um, so I don't think it, it's necessarily the, the role that you play. I think the key characteristics for me are taking time to understand an individual and actually care about them. You know, part of the processes that I do, and I probably am, letting the cat out of the bag a little bit. I don't just take the interviewer's note. I will go around the organisation and speak to people that they've interacted with as they've come into our service. Mm. So when they sign in at reception, how were they? Did they ask you about how your day had been? What company was it where they didn't realise that one of the main recruitment tools was the person that picked them up from the airport? Did you read that book? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What was it? Was it Zappos? It was a company. I remember that, but I've done it but here. They said that they, the yeah. driver was part of the organisation yeah, yeah. and they pick them up. And you're so right. That's it. What they like when they came in? Yeah. Uh, well, they just said, can you get Rob for me? Yeah. And then they start over there. And I was like, oh, yeah. okay. They're not personable. They're not it's how you treat yeah. people yeah. that you that you, there's, there's no reward for it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that's why I think the, the great leaders, and we've all had them, haven't we, that we've worked for or worked with. And I think you can see it a mile off. Mm. Are they credible? Do they do what they say they're going to do? Do they take time to listen and understand and care? They're the people that actually run the organisation. They're the glue that sticks it together. It's not me. It's not the executive team. Far from it. We're just a, a few people. Oh, what's that? I forget what it was. Not Icky Guy. That's your own purpose. But there's a there's a Japanese analogy where it's like the threads that run through the organization mm-hmm. and you'll have them do you know what i mean like yeah, you say yeah, the yeah. people that you speak to at firefighter level the out the, the odd crew commander here or there or the person in comms corporate comms or the person at workshops or the person yeah. hr those cultural i was calling like cultural architects yeah they're, they're advocates for the service yeah, as well aren't they you know yeah, irrespective of their yeah, rank yeah, or whatever yeah. and whenever you see them you're like hey up How's it yeah. feeling? And they're like, oh, yeah, X, Y, Z. And you're like, they will tell Dude, you. Did you see that thing? And they're like, yeah, mate, I saw that right. Yeah. You came across really badly. Yeah. Or, they'll tell you the truth. Yeah, they'll tell you they'll as go, it is. Honestly, that didn't land. Don't or, dress yeah. it up. And I always say, I'm not precious. Yeah. Don't think you're going to upset me. Yeah. You know, just say what you want to say. Mm. Because I think that way you get the, the, the true reality of what people are feeling and thinking. Mm. I wanted to ask you, because you made a great point earlier around moving away from from the frontline services and it actually speaks both to myself not not working in, in a frontline role as such now but also some of the incredible people that we have that are non-operational staff how do you stay motivated when you are not directly interacting with the public on a day-to-day basis or is there ways to stay motivated with the purpose of the organization when you're not 
a front line anymore. Yeah, you can look. I'll I'll make sure I turn out to incidents, and you know I'll tell fire control that I'm going to an incident, whether I'm needed or not. Firstly, it's making sure that the operational crews know that I'm there to support them, have a chat with them, help them. You know, I went to a serious house fire that had spread the other day, and I I knew that the officers in charge were struggling and were a little bit stretched, so I just turned out and gave them a hand. Mm. Went and checked lofts and things like that, you know, get back to basics, because I need to understand the reality of the job today rather than thinking out, uh, at it through a lens of 15 years ago, because I need to make decisions, or I am making decisions, that are impacting those individuals on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. So if my reality is somewhat warped, then I wouldn't be making good decisions. Mm-hmm. So about regularly going out to stations, you know, we have a system of watch visits, I'm going to one after this today at lunchtime, um, just making sure you engage with them, mm-hmm. understand what they're going through, because... Yes, I've got stretch stresses as a chief fire officer, but equally, they've got stresses on a daily daily basis. No one's more important or less important than the other. Um, and I think it's just taking time to engage and be honest and talk, explain. They'll explain their position, I'll explain mine. You know, we know we're not going to agree with everything all of the time, but at least we understand each other's position. And I think that way you're in a stronger position and it influences the culture. They call me Rob. You know, I was christened Rob. I wasn't <laughs> caught christened Bossel, so, so let's have that open conversation. Um, doesn't mean that there's no respect. Yeah. Far from it. I respect them. And, you know, equally they respect me for the role that I do. And just make it with just people. We're all people. And as you said, I think everybody comes to do a great job every day. Yeah. And nobody comes to be malicious. One or two might. Um, but <laughs> the majority of people, you know, the El Pareto rule of 80-20. Yeah, yeah. I think in the fire service, it's more like 90-10. Yeah, 100%. And sometimes if you're working in the 10% all of the time, you can think the whole organisation is like that. Yep. You have to lift your head up, get out there, and see that 90% of the organisation is fantastic and won't do a good job. I love that. Over a long career, is there anything um, you wish you'd spend less time doing or more time doing, or like a piece of advice you think people should ignore? Yeah, I think the bit that you should ignore is that bit I talked about before, that one watch, stay here for the rest of your career, it's great. The organisation is massive, got loads of opportunities, go out and grab them and be curious of what's out there. I think the things I'd spend less time on as an individual is worrying about the small stuff. At the end of the day, we can get very stressed and concerned about the small stuff, and we sometimes have to put it into perspective. You know, I just supported a a colleague that unfortunately passed away three, four weeks ago, who he had a brain tumour, terminal brain tumours. His outlook was unbelievably positive. I thought, wow. You know, if he knew what was going to happen, but I sat with him in his garden and he was just saying, you know, just think about, put it in perspective. Sometimes we create the little things into massive things that aren't massive. And I think we need to reset ourselves sometimes. You know, we've got a, an individual that's um, been tragically injured in a in a training exercise. His life changed overnight, but he is the most positive individual I've ever met. Wow. And you think if he can do it, the little things I don't know, need to worry about, you know. So it's all about, perspective and, yeah. and reality some of those stoic principles as well yeah, i always yeah. think of like, like a stoic reset button we, you start getting so insular you start getting wrapped up in your own world and you just need to keep banging that. i yeah, hit that reset button yeah. probably 10 times a day yeah you've, you've got like, to yeah well, you've, you've just got to, got to. it's okay yeah. oh, okay i just wandered into my own self importance yeah, 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 yeah. right reset zoom out yeah. okay the world's not over exactly. the sky's not falling everything's not not yeah, about yeah, to, yeah. to go yeah. upside down i wanted to ask you proudest moment in the job I know you probably only pick thousands, but yeah. proudest moment in the job if you have one. Difficult. I, I do think. I mean, every I've been asked many times, what what are you most proud of? I think it, it's the people, the people in our organisation. We have some fantastic people, and to see people that have come into the organ, you know, I was in learning development, and to see those people grow as individuals and make a, a great career, mm. I think. You know, we, we do that as an organisation. Some of the bits when we look at people who've been on our Prince's Trust programmes that, you know, I did a celebration for the Prince's Trust the other day 
And these individuals, before the 12 week program, couldn't come out of their bedroom because they were that anxious. Wow. And then they stood up on a celebration of success doing a presentation. I think, wow. We're not that bad of a service. If you've influenced a young people like that, and they, they'd gone on, they'd got, you know, they'd got a place on a college course, they'd got a part-time job. I thought, well, you know, job done. This is what I'm saying about the roles that we have the yeah, ability yeah. to play in our community. We've got a lot of skill sets that we don't realise we have, but we're in a privileged position, oh, and we so don't so see it. We don't yeah. see it a lot of the know, time, yeah. you know. <laughs> Get wrapped up in ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We forget how much more we've got able That's to it. offer yeah, the communities. Yeah. Yeah. Dead positive, Rob. I love that, mate. Thank Brilliant. You so much for your no, time. me too. Great um, to talk to you. I would love to come back and spend some more time with the organisation. Any time. But uh, thank you for that, my friend. Any time. Okay. The Firefighters Podcast is a global podcast seeking to develop, inspire, and motivate the world of the emergency services operators. Through a series of wide-ranging conversations celebrating those within our sector, we seek to encourage and support this incredible group of people. It's brought to you by myself, operational firefighter Pete Wakefield, and I speak with individuals from all walks of life who I sincerely believe can add value to or develop those who have chosen this life path. Please support your emergency services wherever you are in the world, and thank you for listening.